physiological uh, audiences, but I'm very interested to hear your feedback. It's something that I'm currently excited about, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's a project that takes me far out of my comfort zone, as I, I suspect it would most people. And now I'll start. The golden record has long stood in the limelight, shining resplendently and proudly carrying a slice of human culture to the outer edges of the universe. The golden record was the brainchild of Carl Sagan, the American popularizer of space and science. The golden record is a kind of interstellar mixtape that was placed on board the Voyager spacecraft that was launched into outer space in 1977, exactly 40 years ago. Um, and, uh, well. Uh, 40, 41 years ago. Last year there were lots of uh, celebrations. Um, the record contained a good sampling of music from various traditions across the globe before the term world music actually became current, current, uh, common currency. From Australian Aboriginal music to Azerbaijani bagpipes, from Peruvian panpipes to Pygmy Girls initiation songs. A good chunk of popular music is included too, which is represented by Blind Willie Johnson, Louis Armstrong, and Chuck Berry. There are all sorts of rumors swirling around whether the Beatles song, Here Comes the Sun, was supposed to be included or not, but uh, the story goes NASA couldn't secure the copyright from EMI. The European art music tradition is represented by Renaissance dancers, Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, and Stravinsky. And despite the efforts to create a representative worldwide sampling of musical traditions, the curators could not stop themselves from including multiple pieces by Bach and Beethoven. The Golden Record opens with the second Brandenburg Concerto and it closes with the Cavatina from Beethoven's String Quartet, Opus 130. And this slow movement had always held a special place in the hearts of Carl Sagan and his collaborator and later wife, Anne Bryan. Besides this compilation of music, the Golden Record also includes greetings in 55 languages in the spirit of interstellar friendship, sounds of the earth in an act of early eco-musicology, and 116 images of various scenes from our blue planet and its inhabitants. Like all mixtapes, this eclectic choice says less about the intended receivers than it does about the senders. The Golden Record uses a representational sample of the diversity of sounds of the world, and it appeals to universal values. It, it's trying to sum up, somehow, what life on Earth mean, means. And at the same time, it preserves a slice of culture that is indelibly marked as 1977. A fair amount of ink has been spilled about the music on the Golden Record. This 40-year-old playlist of musical highlights from around the world has been called a message in a bottle, a mixtape to the gods, a time capsule, as well as a strictly symbolic act without any meaning for anyone other than humans. Today, I want to say fairly little uh, about the selection of musics included on the record, but we can definitely talk more about this uh, in the Q&A because there's a lot to say about this. But my ambition here today is to aim higher. The question that I want to pose is this. What might actually happen if someone found the golden record at the other end? And I know this question has the, the whiff of the absurd to it, so I'll try again. A somewhat broader question. Can we use music in communication across species and across civilizations? So when, the, when Voyager was launched in 1977, the idea of intelligent life in space was a pipe dream. Since then, astrophysicists have discovered myriad exoplanets, and the idea that there might actually be life out there has become much, much more likely. Um, I think we're currently at an estimated 100 billion exoplanets. So statistically, it's become more likely than unlikely that there might be someone out there. And in fact, SETI, the study of extraterrestrial intelligence, has suggested a few constants that we can reasonably, reasonably expect in life on other planets. SETI is especially interested in uh, planets with water, the precondition of all life as we know it. And sentient beings elsewhere in the universe are almost certainly carbon-based, um, maybe, just maybe silicon-based, but uh, there's, there's a lot of controversy about that. And they will likely exist in a liquid medium such as water or gaseous atmosphere. Sensory perception on other planets 
is expected to be significantly reliant on vibrations, oscillations, and waves, um, as it is among sentient beings on Earth. SETI has great faith in the universality of numbers, and they expect the binary system of zeros and ones, of on and off impulses, to be universally understood by intelligent life. That sets some very basic parameters, which also limits the vast possibilities in our question of communication. So with this in mind, I want to return, I want to turn to the materialities of communication in this interstellar context. The golden record has long stood in the limelight, but it is actually a modest piece of equipment uh, that is the key player here. On the outside of the Voyager spacecraft, a turntable stylus unit is tucked behind the disk. In fact, the stylus is so ordinary that there is no image available. Um, so I had to use the representation of the stylus on the, uh, on the aluminum cover of the golden record. Here we, we have it. In other words, NASA sent a proto-gramophone into outer space. Without the stylus unit, the golden record would be nothing but a gilded circle with a wiggly line etched into each side, fitted with an enigmatic metal sheet of non-verbal explanations, which we can see here. So this image is often taken to be the golden record itself, but it's actually just the cover. Um, it does require a good amount of detective work to decipher the wordless instruction manual. NASA clearly assumed that the aliens who would potentially find the golden record possess detailed knowledge of physics and chemistry. They need to understand, for instance, that the two circles, um, each marked with a dash in the center and another dash on the perimeter and linked by a short line, represent a hydrogen bond with a single electron circling a single proton in each half of the molecule. Our smart aliens must then be aware of the spin of proton and electron at the time it takes to change from one energy level into another. This extremely short duration, this is an extremely short duration, but it has the distinct advantage of being highly stable and reliable in all parts of the universe. This unit of time is then applied elsewhere as the basic interstellar stellar unit of time. And you can see it, you can see the binary code everywhere. So these are multiplications of, of the basic unit. Um, the numbers are always given in binary code marked as dashes and lines. To be fair, it's not unreasonable to assume if an interstellar message, message were found on another planet that this alien society would provide considerable resources towards the decoding. Um, I, and I imagine that any team of heroic intergalactic musicologists who try to decipher the golden record would probably receive assistance from a team of menial rocket scientists. <laughs> and here is where the stylus comes in. Without it, our potential alien might think the record was just a round and shiny yellow ornament, decorated with mysterious elaborate circular etchings or an unusually crunchy cookie. The stylus allows the wiggly runes of the gramophone to be read and in this way to channel any further communication. It's worth remembering, particularly fr from our mostly digital perspective 40 years later, that the choice of a gramophone record was far from obvious. Even back in 1977, gramophone recordings were already the stuff of yesteryear. The state of the art recording technology was magnetic tape. Why then did NASA revert to older technology? Because the gramophone record was more durable and simpler than magnetic tape, especially when, when strung to the outside of a spaceship exposed to radiation at extreme temperatures, the magnetized tape would, would have suffered and decayed. The simpler materiality of the disk won the day. It was a happy coincidence that the year uh, also marked the centenary of Edison's invention of the gramophone in 1877. Attached to the spacecraft, right underneath the golden record, the playback device would enable aliens to reconvert the revolving slopes of the re record groove into sounding data. The gramophone technology for the golden record was modified in only one respect. To maximize the playing time, the recording was modified and the recording speed was slowed down to 16 two thirds. That is half the standard speed of, uh, of the common LP format with its 33 and one third um, rotations per minute. In this way, the recording time was doubled while the loss of fidelity was deemed within a bearable range. <coughs> of course, all these calculations were based on human auditory standards and it's hard to imagine any other standards that NASA could have used in this regard. But this leads us back precisely to the question that I want to ask 40 years on, 
What would actually happen if the mixtape, that intergalactic message in a bottle on its way through outer space, reached intelligent life? An extraterrestrial who managed to decipher the instructions and got the record to play. What might we expect to happen at the other ear? Uh, at the other end, what does listening actually mean in this interstellar context? There's a straightforward answer. We simply don't know. The possibilities are endless. For all we know, the extraterrestrials who find the, the record might have the brain the size of a planet like Marvin the, the paranoid android, or three ears the size of a Brussels sprout. Who knows what that means for his listening habits and musical tastes? But that doesn't mean we have to throw our hands up in the air. What we can do is to examine uh, the material traces and to extract meaning from the elements that NASA has given us, with a view to getting, getting closer to a sense of what listening in this extreme situation might mean. Put differently, what does the technology offer in, a, in the way of aiding and channeling communication in this transspecies and interstellar context? From this perspective, the inclusion of the stylus is very significant, a device that transduces the movement of the gramophone needle as it moves along the groove and feels the divergences of the line etched into the record into electromagnetic energy. But just as significant is the fact that Voyager does not include amplifier and speakers, devices that turn the electromagnetic waves into sound output. We can best imagine the work of the Golden Record as involved in a series of interfaces that pass on information, and in this case music, across shared boundaries, each of which requires a transformation, a new kind of mapping of the data. So let's plot this out. <coughs> if we begin, as we typically do, with musicians producing sounds, which are then recorded and engraved in the LP, we get the first part of our graph covering the essential stations of the recording pro process. But going beyond that, the reproduction cycle here on Earth typically covers reading, sounding, and listening. The stylus initiates the reproduction, but what comes afterwards remains unspecified. The interface with alien ears remains a blank. The missing link in the chain from gramophone groove to musical listening can be seen as a metaphor for the dazzling range of possibilities that alien listening entails. The furthest interface Voyager can determine is the stylus that allows the grooves of the gramophone record to be turned into vibrations. The stylus is the final frontier. Beyond it lies unknowingness. Reports of the golden record are often fascinated by the music that is encoded in the disc. This, this is no doubt spurred by the fact that it has become rare for music to stand in the cosmic limelight. But it's worth remembering that music is not the only thing that is being transmitted into outer space. As we said earlier, the grooves of the disc also contain spoken words, the greetings in 55 languages, and um, the over 100 images depicting our world, world and its inhabitants. From a media theoretical perspective, this diversity of expressive forms assembled on the record is a technological masterstroke that deserves further unpacking and that can help us pave a path that crosses beyond that final frontier. So the media theorist Friedrich Kittler has reminded us that gramophone records constitute a form of writing, a form of notation, though it's not one that's read with human eyes in the manner of a regular strip that turns characters into words and sentences with specific meanings or into melodies or, and chords in the case of music. Rather, it is a form of transcribing the pressure changes of the air molecules. Uh, it's a form of writing that leaves a trace of the sound wave in the material of the record, face faithfully transcribing the pressure changes of the air molecules that we register as sound. Like writing, recordings enable the three essential functions that characterize all technical, technical media, recording, storing, and transmitting data. What is special about the sonic writing is, is, is that it's legible to the touch of the stylus. The gramophone form, forms one third of the technologies that make up what Kittler calls the discourse network circa 1900. And simplifying somewhat, we can think of discourse network as the media structures by which we make sense of the world. For Kittler, the situation circa 1900 was determined by a division of writing down systems into medium-specific technologies, gramophone, film, typewriter. 
And as some of you may know, this is also the title of his groundbreaking book from 1986. Each of the three technologies specializes in one medium of communication, sound, image, word, and each is specialized in one mode of uh, making sense of the world, listening, looking, and reading. Each technology is extremely good in its own domain, far surpassing what had been possible on paper and ink, that is the medium that had dominated the previous discourse network in all three domains. But this increased degree of specialization came at a price. The three technologies were less versatile with other kinds of messages. So to understand what the gramophone changed in the field of music, think about it this way. Western musical notation is very efficient at communicating some things and very rudimentary at others. The problem is well known to anyone who's ever worked with non-Western music. It so happens that most of the parameters that Western music cares about are also the ones that are easily notated in our diastematic script, primarily pitch and rhythm. But if we try to notate other musical transition, uh, tra traditions in Western notation, we scramble to get the nuances right. Let's use an example from a piece that is actually included in the Golden Record, uh, Flowing Waters, uh, for the Chinese um, Gu Qin. Here we see the traditional notation. We should be hearing this now. Okay. Um, well, uh, you have to imagine the sound of it. Um, uh, and there are two different transcriptions um, that are taken. Let's see. Mm. Ah. Try again. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay, I'll make this a little bit softer because I'm trying to talk over it. Okay, well, you heard a few sounds of <laughs> um, let's Let's try this again. Um, it's really just background sounds, but it would be nice to get it. Yeah, okay. And so you can see these are very different transcriptions um, because, you know, the source code um, is not very specific about rhythm, uh, about the rhythmic organization of, uh, of uh, this traditional piece of music. Um, of course, now I have no idea where I was in my script. Uh, oh, I see here. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the Chinese tablature notation used for the Guqin, for instance, is very specific about attack articulation and tuning, and it's quite vague about other factors, such as rhythmic organization, in a way that cannot easily be translated into the grid of Western notation. It's the wrong interface. And so the two, the two uh, possible translation of flowing waters show that they're quite different. It's not wholly impossible to notate these sounds, but Western notation requires a transcriber to fix certain dimensions one way or another that have a level of indeterminacy in the original tablature. And famously, the philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the 18th century was very aware of how notation constrained our understanding of music. So this was obviously at a time before gramophone recordings. And when he saw notated ex examples of non-Western music, he marveled with mock admiration at the visual similarity to Western music. And he slyly noted that the resemblance can mean two things. It will make some admire the worthiness and universality of our rules, and it will perhaps make others doubt the fidelity or the comprehension of those who've transmitted these airs. And obviously, this is rhetorical. It's the latter that he believes is the case. There is a certain normative notational logic that goes hand in hand with the music that is supposed to be encoded and that carries within, within it certain assumptions about the musical tradition that is being encoded. It's perhaps useful to think of written notation in the manner of a filter or perhaps even better as a kind of cookie cutter. Only certain elements can pass through it, and the material is reshaped to fit that mold. For a gramophone recording, by contrast, it's not necessary to understand the notational system, uh, that is, the underlying logic on which the encoded music is based. The stylus does not need to take recourse to notes, that is, abstract and idealized symbols, that are effectively a recipe for the reproduction of sound. The trace of the needle is a direct impression of the sound wave. But as a consequence, the gramophone recording doesn't discriminate between music and non-music. If during a recording session a chair falls over or a wrong note is played, 
uh, or a musician starts coughing, all these noises are dispassionately etched into the record groove, whether they are supposed to be there or not. For the record, there's no right or wrong. What exists is only sound, nothing else. In this medium, the singular performance becomes infinitely repeatable. For a recording technology that treats all music the same, even an improvised performance is not a representation of a diversity of possibilities, but the thing itself. What is recorded is only the sound made absolute in the literal, in the literal sense, loosened from the conditions of its creation. No cultural context is given in the grooves of the disc. We don't know if there was dancing in the original performance, if there was ceremonial, if there was improvisatory back and forth. Any form of social interaction is excluded from the recording. In a word, there is no outside of the recording. This is a famous quote from the French philosopher Jacques Derrida, adapted to our cir circumstances. The Golden Record catapults Kitlerian media theory to the nth degree in the context of interstellar communication. When we said initially that the Golden Record carries a slice of human culture into outer space, the full consequences of this situation come to the fore in this realization. The Golden Record contains all the human culture that extraterrestrials are likely to encounter. In a, word, in a world compressed into the grooves of the gramophone record from which the entire culture of our planet must be reconstructed. No wonder NASA felt the need to give data compression a legger by cutting the revol revolving speed in half down to 16 and 2 thirds. Kittler explains exuberantly that the gramophone record has no filter function, no cookie cutter through which the sounds must pass before they can be stored. The record, he continues to enthuse, allows even nonsense to be perpetuated. And this is just the flip side of the gramophone's indifference to any systematic thought behind the recording. Its stubborn refusal to divide sounds into music and non-music. And this is why it's possible to notate specimens of different musical traditions in the same space, to live on in peaceful coexistence side by side on the grooves of the golden record, whether other notational systems, uh, where other notational systems would have necessarily failed. The world music that the Golden Record captures and carries to a galaxy far, far away becomes a reality thanks to the specific permissiveness of recording technology. Truth be told, Kittler got a little carried away when he waxed lyrical about the gramophone. It's true that the cookie cutter function here is less rigid than what we find in notation and writing, but it still exists. It just operates on different principles. In fact, the cookie cutter of the gramophone is well attuned to human hearing and that's why Kittler didn't notice it. But in this interstellar, trans-species context of the filter function, the, the filter function of recording technology comes critically into focus. And that's where we'll turn next. For a mission with the farthest poss possible ambition into the great intergalactic unknown, it stands to reason that the golden record as a storage device is also more ambitious than your average LP. It doesn't stop with the music. The Golden Record attempts a certain all-embracing reunion of the arts that renegotiates the relationship between input and output in which not only music is stored in the record grooves but also in words and images. Words have the least distinctive identity in the Golden Record. They exist as voice recordings in the parade of greetings to potential alien listeners according to the customs and in the languages of our <laughs> earthly cultures as images of printed text notably in the address of the American president, Jimmy Carter, contributed to the mission who preferred TypeScript for a speech over the spoken word. For all their usefulness on Earth, words and languages are perhaps the most limited form of expression in this broadest, boundless context. The most charming of the greetings in Southern Min dialect spoken in the Fujian province in Southeast China illustrates this problem well. Oh, here we have the address by Jimmy Carter. Um, but the Chinese uh, greeting goes, friends of space, how are you all? Have you eaten yet? Come visit us if you have time. It hardly bears mentioning that languages are a repository of cultural assumptions. What literally means, have you eaten yet, or have you eaten your fill, has come to signify, hello, how are you? This kind of, at the correct answer, I, I'm told is, yes, I have eaten, thank you very much. The kind concern makes intuitive sense to Earth dwellers with their need for regular food intake, an experience we all share. But the extra step, 
the required int uh, intellectual transference that humans habitually make, the carrying across that all metaphors demand, might not mean much to other extraterrestrial cultures, even if they were to succeed in cutting through the linguistic complexities on the sole basis of this short example. Clearly, there's no shortage of optimistic assumptions being made here, even if we ignore the improbability that extraterrestrials will understand human languages or that they would be able to reconstruct them on the basis of, this, of the very short snippets of speech included in the record, or indeed that they will be able to decipher the Latin alphabet in which Carter's address was typed, it's still something of a stretch to believe that extraterrestrials will actually be able to hear our messages. We should not take words too literally here. The verbal aspects of the message sent into outer space are by far the most symbolic aspect of the Golden Record. And this is perfectly summarized by Carl Sagan's stealthy inscription, which he etched by hand in the center of the Golden Record, to the maker of makers of music, all worlds, all times. This all-embracing greeting is a classic performative contradiction. It will only be intelligible to English-speaking humans. So, with their extreme limitations, words don't occupy much of a separate domain in the Golden Record, but they spill into the sonic and into the visual spheres. One noteworthy visual image included is a page from the score of Beethoven's Cavatina Opus 30, 130, complete with the picture of a tiny violin, <laughs> the solo instrument of this movement. This piece of notation is the musical equivalent of the president's speech in TypeScript. The visual mode of exp expression deserves some attention here. How exactly do you encode images on a gramophone recording? Even though we expect to hear sounds when we put a gramophone on the turntable, there is absolutely no necessity for sounds to be the ultimate purpose of a record. Data is unspecific in the first place. Think of the sequences of zeros and ones of electromagnetic charges that make up computer code in a way that is legible for a CPU and for virtually no one else. This is the reason cassette tapes of the 1980s could be used not only for recording music, but also for storing computer programs on the early generations of home computers. NASA decided, not unreasonably, that the logic of binary code ought to be inde intelligible to exoplanetary life. And the binary principle can also be used on gramophone records as a storage device for a sonified data stream. In fact, the B-side of the golden record is reserved for this other kind of music, if we want to call it that. The B-side includes encoded pixelated images, most of them in color and some of them in black and white. Um, a test image is given in the instructions, and I've pulled that out from here. A simple circle within a rectangular frame. This serves as the calibration page. It's the first page that's encoded. Um, and another image engraved just above the frame circle on the sheet indicates how the data stream must be mapped across the rectangular matrix from top to bottom and from left to right. The one-dimensional sound wave must be folded, as it were, across the two-dimensional space of the visual matrix, folded and woven across the space at a constant speed. Each dot in the matrix is indicated by a short sound, a click, and each space is a moment of silence. This is the equivalent of the ones and zeros of binary code. The correct image emerges in a 19 by 29 matrix, any other mapping will result in gobbledygook. Each image can therefore have 551 pixels. If our intelligent alien recognizes that the first block of sounds on the B side corresponds to the circular image in the instructions, then she will have cracked the encryption code. Any of the subsequent images, which are much more complex, follow the same pattern. The code is effectively the bandpass filter, that is the cookie cutter through which the data is sent. And here is a reconstruction from the circular data from the golden record, in a reconstruction by an earthbound blogger who clearly had too much time on their hands. Um, in fact, by looking at the sound wave itself, uh, using, and you know, if here we are using visualization created on Audacity, we can see that the circle is encoded in a visually immediate way. The critical part here is that this data encrypted in the sound wave and etched into a gramophone record is meant to be reconstructed as visual 
but it can also be sounded. Digital data, zeros and ones, don't have any intrinsic meaning but can be turned into different expressive forms, sounds or images. So the vibration pattern that we, in our limited human perspective, call sound waves are not necessarily correlated to one and only one sensory modality. As a consequence, we have the paradoxical situation that we can hear the images. They sound a little bit like low, a low machine buzz at 60 hertz, recognizable as a pitch somewhere in the middle between B flat and B. If the pitch fluctuates, as it does in an occasional flutter, it's at the octave, and it sounds like this. Okay, you get the idea. Every eight seconds, the continuous hum is punctuated by two test beeps which demarcate beginning and end of the pixel data, five octaves higher, around B5. Whatever kind of music this might be, it's certainly not good music. But then again, by what intergalactic standards should we evaluate Earth music anyway? What that means is that there are actually two representations of Beethoven's Cavatina on board of the Voyager spacecraft that are being communicated into outer space. One is the recording that, uh, uh, of the sounds of a string quartet, and here we hear it in the background. The other is a recording of an image of the sheet music that we saw earlier. But both can be heard through human ears, if we so choose, but they would sound very different. We should adapt our chart of interfaces that we used earlier to understand the realm of possibilities opened up by data conveyed on the golden record where we could follow the path from recording to reproduction by means of the stylus, things have become a whole lot more complicated now. If we can sonify visual and auditory artifacts, we have two different routes of passage here that both converge in the gramophone and in the stylus. But the outcome becomes increasingly less specific as far as the sensory domain is concerned. In specifying ears and eyes, in the far right box of my diagram, I'm remaining within human sens uh, sensory modalities. But it's perhaps best to refer to this as perception most broadly conceived. We will go get furthest here in this most intergalactic of contexts if we stop thinking about the sounds as music and start thinking of them as data streams. What we find on the two sides of the golden record are two distinct ways of using the data storage function of the gramophone record. The A side treats the medium as analog, and the B side as if it were digital. We as humans hear the clicks on the B side as a kind of music by default, but that's just how our auditory apparatus works. And we simply cannot avoid processing these signals the way we always do. But there's nothing to say that this is what it necessarily is. If we know how to read the signals properly, that is, if we decode them by imposing a new kind of grammar, a different cookie cutter or bandpass filter on the sound wave, we can get the gramophone groove to record and reproduce images. It all becomes a matter of finding the best interface. I want to press this point a little further because the strange music on the B side can help us understand better can help us understand better in our global question to figure out what happens when we get beyond the stylus in our chain of interfaces. Why do we actually hear digital data as a buzz? For an answer, we should return to Earth because there are many more examples of this method of creating music, if we can call it that. The acoustical device called Savar Wheel, and we see a 19th century image here, demonstrates the underlying principle in a fairly straightforward way. Anyone who's ever put a beer mat, beer mat um, or a coaster between the spokes of a bicycle wheel knows how this works. The Savar wheel is a cogwheel that strikes a flexible cardboard and sets it in vibration. When the wheel spins slowly, we hear a regular pulsation as a rhythm, and when the wheel speeds up, around 20 strikes per second or faster, the sensation turns into a pitch. This perceptual boundary, when rhythm transforms into pitch, is called the auditory threshold. Electronic and tape-based music has long known this effect and has, got, has used it to great effect. 
the whole genre of, of one-bit music from the first generation of arcade games in the 1970s was based on exactly that effect. Um, and the composer Karl-Heinz Stockhausen explained the underlying phenomenon quite vividly. I and here I quote him. I recorded individual pulses from an impulse generator and spliced them together in a particular rhythm. Then I made a tape loop of this rhythm. Let's say it is tak tak tak, a very simple rhythm. And then I speed it up, tarak tak tarak tak tarak tak tarak tak, and so on. After a while, the rhythm becomes continuous. And when I speed it up still more, you begin to hear a low tone rising in pitch. That means this little period, tarak tak tarak tak, which lasted about a second, is now lasting less than one sixteenth of a second. Um, because at a frequency of around 16 cycles per second uh, is the lower limit of the perception of pitch and a sound vibrating at 16 cycles per second corresponds to a very low fundamental pitch on the organ." End quote. Stockhausen included this effect in his important electronic composition Contacte, and here we see the, a graphic score for the piece. And I would have loved it if NASA had had the foresight to include this piece in the Golden Record, but they didn't. Stockhausen famously declared that he was born on Sirius, so that's good enough for me. The way the principle is employed in contacted is exactly the other way around from what we saw earlier. We hear a high-pitched sound that meanders and slows down, descending in pitch until we finally hear it as a series of clicks. And so um, uh, I'm going to play you the piece in a minute. and. After a few seconds in, uh, you should be able to follow this line, um, and then you can see how you can hear how it <coughs> meanders downwards and gets slower and slower until you start hearing it as a series of individual clicks that then speed up and <coughs> become slower still. And this is all the same uh, sound source; it's just played at different speeds. So let's hear it. The way the auditory threshold is highlighted in this example is remarkable, as we rarely get to experience it. We can hear Stockhausen's recorded sound object as a rhythm or as a pitch. The difference is merely one of time scale. The distinction between the two perceptual parameters, rhythm and pitch, is absolutely fundamental for our earthbound human music. It is dictated by the constraints of human physiology and the way our auditory system operates. But in the sound wave, they exist in the same dimension. Both are just different registers of the T-axis. Another way of saying that is that our human ears fold the sound wave in such a way that different regions of the temporal axis become separate parameters. This is equivalent to the way in which the sound wave was folded across the rectangular mat matrix on the B side of the golden record. So with this in mind, we can return to Voyager in outer space and to the buzzing images of the B side on the golden record. To human ears, these images hum uh, at 39 hertz, that is comfortably below the comfortably above the auditory, the human auditory threshold, so that we can hear them as a pitch between low B flat and B. Once we fold the sound wave in the way our ears are wont to do, but there are also clicks like Stockhausen's tarak tak that may be perceived as different things if different kinds of ears hear them. In other words, if we want to stare into the great unknown that lies beyond the stylus, we have to let go. We have to let go of our certainties about what listening means. The B side of the golden record is a great test case because it confronts us with a different kind of cookie cutter to which human ears are insensitive. The same is likely true for the other samples of music on the A side when presented to non-human ears. We cannot make any educated guesses what the specific constraints of non-human perceptual systems are. The options are wide open. But my advice to let it go, and there's a song in there somewhere, is not tantamount to throwing our hands up in the air. What it means is this. 
to make headway, we have to get more attuned to the way in which these interfaces operate on music. We can get further in this interstellar context if we go back to basics. That is, if we try to think of music as data streams, as vibrations. These vibrations must be reconfigured to fit the sensory apparatus of whatever extraterrestrial being might pick up the golden record at the other end. This is the interface that carry us, will carry us beyond the point where the stylus left us dangling, right on the edge of the abyss that leads into the unknown. Granted, we might not be able to get very far beyond the abyss without having a better idea of what kind of life form we would be trying to communicate with. But what we can do is to get a much stronger sense of where our human constraints are. What we need to understand to get further with non-human modes of listening is to develop an awareness that the multiple dimension of our sound world, pitch and rhythm, but also timbre and articulation are all ultimately temporal functions that are stored along the sound wave. Even though we perceive them as discrete parameters, this multidimensional perception of the sound wave is a radical interpretation that our sensory apparatus imposes on the sound wave as one element in our succession of interfaces. Our ears fold the sound wave into a multidimensional construct, just as the golden record instructs the unknown alien to bend the image, re the image recordings into 29 lines of equal length. We don't know exactly um, we don't know where exactly Voyager is taking the golden record and if anyone will ever listen to its recording. But one thing is for sure. If the stylus leaves us at the abyss, the folding of the sound wave in accordance with other filters, cookie cutters and interfaces, will take us across. Thank you. So I'm certain there are questions <laughs> for Alex. Yes, Mark. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. I, I enjoyed that enormously. Um, I, I, was, I started off um, mentally reading your paper against what, um, I'm, what I'm sure you know about the, um, the, the, the purely terrestrial experiment that was conducted in 1907, where um, four cases of early flat breast records were actually um, uh, were deposited in the Paris Opera with instructions mm -hmm. to be opened um, 100 years later, and, and they were in, 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 uh, in 2007. And I, I you know, and, and, and there's, there's a lot that's very similar. The, you know, the, 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 the technology was actually preserved with the, um, uh, with the, with the recordings, and, and it, was, it was a stylus. Yeah. Um, uh, plus the, uh, you know, plus the, the, um, the, uh, the machine that went, the, that went with it. And um, when you came back at the end of your, uh, end of your paper with a, with a kind of invitation to think about how different we might actually be, uh -huh. um, uh, actually that brought me back exactly to that comparison. Because what that, um, uh, what that history from 1907 to 2007 does, which was so beautifully done yeah. in um, uh, in, in Paris is exactly that. It tells us exactly what um, uh, what uh, musical human beings are like in 2007, and to an extent what they were like in 1907. Um, and I just wonder whether you had any had any thoughts about, um, in a sense, that as a sort of rather nicely controlled experiment, yeah. which does actually give you just a way in to understanding what it might be like for a moderately alien culture. I didn't to, know about this. It sounds fascinating and I'd love to know more about it. But um, what was recorded? Do we know? I, I guess we must know. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was, it was all kind of standard, standard um, opera repertory from around, from around 1900. Um, and that, that kind of fitted as well with, yeah. the, with the 1977 Voyager project, you know, it's, um, which was all most, most of the, most of the, most of the, most of the popular music is extremely Mm -hmm. 20, 20 years old, no, no, uh, uh, no more. Uh, and actually, most of the most of the new, the most of the classical music there is kind of canonically current. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, these are exactly, these are exactly, the, exactly the same. Yeah. So, you know, at the kind of info level, so, there's a very, very big similarity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One for the other. No, it's, it's, two. It's, it's very interesting that, that you're saying this. Uh, I mean, about the choice of pieces, you know, there are a couple of details that are really interesting because in 1977, uh, you know, Elvis had just died um, and, you know, his star had certainly declined before his death. But uh, the examples of popular music are all uh, firmly in the hand, uh, hands of African American musicians. And, you know, that, that seems a remarkable choice in 1977. Um, the the you're right. The, the classical music is is mostly canonical. They chose Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, which at that time was still not as standard as it, as it is nowadays. So you know they they made a bet, and it it was the right one. Um, but you know that that's probably not a piece that many people would have chosen um, at that time. So the, you know there are there are a couple of elements that are really interesting, um, and you know we. we I'll talk at great length about some of the other choices that they made, but um, the the interesting thing is 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 really, as you say, the temporal dimension in this, um, and we are talking about even you know that vast time span. So um, they've calculated that in forty thousand years, um, Voyager will be further away from the sun than from the nearest other uh, 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 star system. And so it will, you know, the, the best possible scenario is that in 80,000 years someone might find it. So it's, it's, that, <laughs> it's that temporal dimension that we are dealing with. Um, and, you know, quite possibly, uh, it, it, quite possibly it will take a lot longer. There are two uh, Voyager spacecraft that are on slightly different trajectories, so we have twice the chance <laughs> of uh, uh, of having the, the golden record picked out. But um, so astrophysicists also tell me that it's quite likely that they will make it unscathed because there's so little uh, in outer space that that it might collide with. Um, that it's not, you know, you could speculate that. Earth itself is going to be hit by an asteroid before the golden records are going to be destroyed. So there is a there is a decent chance that the two golden records might be the only thing that still exists of human culture. Um, you know, given given a few more millennia. Um, so you know, while there is an interest in 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 the spatial dimension and in the communicative dimension, what initially attracted me to this project was precisely the temporal dimension, the, the time capsule aspect of it. And, uh, you know, which, and, you know, I've, I've, I've long been fascinated in monuments, and so this is a kind of monument. It's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a future commemoration of human culture. Ben, um, yeah, I'm just one, thank you, it's a great talk. Um, do you know the apex twin trap formula? Because at the end of that, there's a sonification of his face, of Richard D. James's face, that you can find if you put the trap through a spectrogram. Oh, I see. So I just wonder if there's a potential extension of this, or how you react to that idea of this kind of, of hidden messages, visual messages, messages within, um, Within, within sound, if that makes sense. You wouldn't know unless you were a geek and you wanted to find out. And, you know, I again, I didn't know about that. But yes, you know, the, those, those kinds of subliminal messages are, you know, that, that's kind of a close comparison. I haven't really looked at them in any specific way. But, um, you know, yes, it's, uh, you know, what's interesting about these attempts, you, you know, I mean, when, when, when Sagan and his team were trying to work out how best to encode these things in you with SETI, they always had this game of sending each other encrypted messages just to see if other people would be able to figure it out. Most of the time they couldn't. Um, and in this case, this blogger, that was also an experiment where they were trying to see if they could figure out how to decode it. And it didn't work. They needed, they needed more explanation than the cover 
provided. Um, so you know, if you don't figure out that the two circles are a, um, are a hydrogen molecule, then you can't figure out anything else. So that's the basis of, of absolutely everything. Um, so, <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the whole project has some, some real problems. Um, the, um, but, you know, and, and what, one of the things that is really fascinating about, you know, going back to the, the, the question of, you know, what does it say about 1977, about the time that, uh, in which it was being created, it's extremely hopeful. It's, you know, it, it, it's quite starry-eyed in a way that, you know, Carl Sagan was. Um, and of course, this is all against the background of the space race, of the oil crisis, of, uh, you know, of the near certainty that we would all die a nuclear death in the next few years. Uh, the Global 2000 report had been, had been issued a few years earlier, where, which, you know, uh, pronounced gloom and doom on, uh, on, on, on the whole planet. So, you know, to do this is partly a kind of cry for help, or, you know, you could also see it as, as a sign of extreme hope. Um, there is, I mean, I don't know how many science fiction fans we have here, but uh, there is a great recent uh, Chinese science fiction uh, story called The Three Body Problem. I recommend, uh, I recommend it to everybody. It's a great read. Um, and it's also concerned with, uh, with the question of uh, sending out messages to outer space. Um, and, uh, you know, the world is pretty terrible in that, in, in that story, but it's nowhere near as bad as this other galaxy that picks up um, a human message and that is trying to invade Earth because that planet is more habitable than theirs. Um, and so, you know, sending out a message is not necessarily a good thing. And a lot of people, um, uh, were very worried that we are giving away information of where we are. You know, if someone else finds finds that information, they might they might want to come here and uh, do terrible things to us. So it can always go either way. Matthew, in keeping with academic tradition or British academic tradition, really. I don't really have a question, but I have some stuff to talk about. Excellent. <laughs> I infer a question for oh, only a British tradition. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so the idea that this golden record, as you say, tells us a lot about ourselves and has all sorts of human-specific stuff embedded in it that um, we're presupposing or hoping that the aliens can measure, and I would say. For Ben's example, I would suggest that the time frequency representation mm. as a way of relating musical sounds and images is far more fundamental than the raster mm -hmm. suggestion of sweeping it across based on television technology of the yep. 70s. So if it were being made today, it would probably be done the Apex Twins way rather than the uh, Carl Sagan way. Yeah. But a couple of things that are implicitly encoded in there. One is the reason LPs are longer players because and we're able to put so much more information than the old Dendry <coughs> records is that because low frequencies have larger displacements with them, mm -hmm. with an electronic chain on the other end past the stars, the bit that wasn't included, you can undo what's called the RIAA curve, which effectively differentiates the signal before putting it on the record. Mm -hmm. So the starless may be enough of a clue to the alien receptors to turn these vibrations into sounds, but it's going to sound awfully tinny yeah. unless there's something, I don't believe there's anything on there to say, and put in a frequency response which effectively integrates it and boosts uh, yeah. the bass back up to what we're hearing. It. And the other thing is that the information hidden in the record, similarly in the encoded images and any other visual images, is all based around all our physiological perceptions appear to obey approximations to the weber fechner law, yeah. whereby we perceive things logarithmically. So the idea of musical intervals corresponding to ratios of frequencies so that equally spaced musical frequencies go 100 hertz. 200, 400, 800, 1600, mm -hmm. and that loudness is amplifier strengths go 10, 100, 1000 watts, and so forth. 
is again, that is natural to us, and that seems like a universality because we detect it yeah. amongst many sense modalities. But had we not evolved neurons and their rather complicated interface and fact behaviors, another species evolved to solve. It seems very reasonable that acoustics yeah. would be a communication medium because it is <coughs> information goes out for my colleague. Tim Layton has uh, done some calculations on how things would sound on different planets. Oh, that sounds great. Right. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I'd love to hear more. The idea that, yeah. um, that when we transmit information this way, we do it in this logarithmically encoded way, as I say, presupposes neurons and some other evolutionary solution, solution yeah. to perception might very well not follow that law. No, that's, that's a very good point. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. I, yeah, <laughs> no, 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 I, I, I completely agree. One, just maybe, maybe to add one point. Um, so current thinking ha goes beyond the binary uh, model and there is n they are now fairly certain that the, uh, the um, periodic table provides a universal basis for the, you know, for, for um, natural numbers so that you know we can assume that integer numbers are also something that can be used um, in interplanetary, uh, uh, interplanetary communication so we needn't always go back to the uh, to the binary method but you know that was that was 1977 it's unclear how we would represent non-binary numbers in a way that is that is intelligible but there's you know that's that's a new point that was um, that SETI added a little while ago. Peter. Thank you. Um, it's a fantastic, fantastic talk, really fascinating. Thank you. One of the things that I find very interesting about that period when you put forward is there's no error correction in the sense of something I'm working on called communication. It's the idea that you build any form of data storage without error correction is incredibly primitive because uh -huh. you have error correction. I'm not sure when I was a primary school, in my primary school one, a video disc. Philips had this amazing video, one or two video discs. I don't know if video discs had error correction. Of course, CDs were being thought about it in that time, yeah. and they had error correction. They do have error corrections, particularly ones and codes and so on. So, is there something special? Was there any error correction? I mean, was there something unique in terms of time when it went out that meant error correction was ignored? Or was it, you know, I'm just surprised it wasn't even there. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not aware of error correction. No, I don't think there was anything like that. Um, but it's a very good point. I mean, you know, just to celebrate the 40th anniversary, they collected tweets that were then sent up uh, into outer space, following more or less the trajectory, I think, of the uh, of, of the Voyager spacecraft. So, you know, there is this element of, you know, m moving on to contemporary technology. Um, but about your specific question on error correction, it's a, it, you know, it's a very good point. I'm not aware that that there, you know, I mean. Gramophones don't have error correction, um, so and you know since there was no playback devices such included, there was no way that um, that error correction could be part of this. But well, I think it was I think it was known that it was going in flash. It was in telephone systems at the time. It was, it was already so yeah. I think the audience was known, but it seems to me that that, I mean, that was a back compatibility issue. That yeah, you can't introduce error correction on records, but it, it, it's now so utterly prevalent. Yeah. It's always stripped away, we don't know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It seems to me that there was a unique few years when we could still have the technology to send something to space, but not not just make it automatic. Yeah. It's going to be digitized and error correct. Yeah, yeah. Right. The aliens could even look at it and think, could they not know error correct? <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's definitely a civilization. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. Full yeah. Terrible. Yes. Yeah, I was just wondering if uh, any consideration was given to surrounded by aliens on this planet called other species. Yes. So, you know, that's... And, uh, yeah, we don't have to go out into outer space yeah. to put into practice these ideas about how you communicate with an alien life form. Absolutely. No, this is a very good point. I'm glad you're I mean, raising this. The big this. thing yeah. that seems to be missing in, in, in the Voyager approach is uh, interpretation yeah. of the signals. Um, yeah. I suppose you could call it semantics. Right. Rather than the, you know, the grammar of the, 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 the means of communication. Because mm -hmm. meaning 
must be lacking totally. Yes, exactly. I mean, if you think of a, a, a whale, for instance, yeah. and we often do these days, um, <coughs> it's, it's, it, the interpretation they might have of sound waves might yeah. not be musical at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're effectively using their ears in the way that we use our eyes yeah. to read facial expressions. No, exactly. How about that as an alien concept? <laughs> it seems that that's what happened because they wouldn't have a visual means of, of reading each other's feelings like we read feelings through facial expressions, like light, because mm -hmm. their, their vision is not good enough. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Their hearing is way beyond our powers. Great. Heaven knows what music is to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, the reason it works for them is, the, is their anatomy involves air cavities within the, uh, the, the facial structure, the skull as well, then the expressions that they can read are, are a result of shifting air you know, between the various chambers. Yes. Uh, and you see how much communication and interpretation of signals depends on your anatomy and Absolutely. Uh, what's yeah. actually going on yeah. inside the, the, the organs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, that's so absolutely right. Pretty good aliens to practice with for a start. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and we haven't gone very far with that. So <laughs> it's uh, no. This is this is a really important point. So there are you know um, s this is something that that critics of SETI bring up a lot. Um, and uh, so you know, f I mean, there's a big debate about uh, you know about all, all sorts of problems. And I think they you know the the the, the points of criticism are uh, are all valid. Uh, you know, one, one big line of criticism is, you know, well, we've been trying for 50 years uh, and we haven't received any signals. What does that mean? You know, it could mean that no one is out there. It could mean that they are hiding from us. Uh, and the response to that has been, well, we've only been trying for 50 years. That's really not very long. We're a very young, uh, you know, earthly civilization. Um, and uh, and uh, the most powerful uh, criticism, I think, is exactly the one that you're making. We, ha you know, there are several non-human intelligent species on Earth that we have not been successful in making contact with, and uh, you know, uh, whales are a great example. The other example that um, people often draw on are uh, octopodes, octopus, um, because they are highly intelligent and their nervous system is organized in a completely different way from any other animal that we know about on Earth. Um, so, you know, if we wanted to try out what we are dealing with in outer space, um, octopus is the greatest example that we have on Earth. And um, we haven't, you know, we know something about uh, octopus uh, audition. Uh, they seem to have an extremely limited pitch range that only goes from about 400 hertz to 1,000 hertz. So human hearing goes from 20 to, to, to 20,000. So it's just a very limited range. Um, but if uh, if octopus audition is anything, you know, if the if the principles are, are um, somewhat equivalent to humans, then presumably what falls under the auditory threshold, uh, under 400 hertz, will be perceived as rhythm, which means that they have, you know, divine rhythmic perception. Um, so you know that that would be some kind of, you know, and it wouldn't be hard to run the music examples through a filter that, you know, that only allows us to hear the pitch range between 400 uh, and 1000 hertz, which is extremely limited. So, you know, we could, to a certain extent, pretend to uh, get a sense of what hearing this music as an octopus would be like. Obviously, there's a whole lot that we don't know about this. but. You know, this is about as good a beginning of trying out something else as anything that we are ever likely to encounter in our lifetime. Another question. Yes, David. Um, a long, long time ago, when I was a teenager, which was about 60 years ago or more, um, uh, I read a book called The Cloud by Fred Hoyle. Huh? And uh, this was a story, a science fiction story, The Cloud. Of this, and the cloud said, uh, Oh, it's just it's quite nice. 
this one is slow. Um, it's just that year three that the and it's not science science, I know the great hand of time is not not as a mention of marketing, which is far too quick for any human to be on the So this is another really interesting factor that should be considered. And this, this goes back to, um, in, to something that um, a, a 19th century biologist fir first uh, suggested, um, Karl Hans von Beer. And he basically, he, he gave a famous talk in front of the Russian uh, Society of Entomologists. And his question was, what's it like to be a fruit fly, effectively? And so, you know, he kind of imagined what the perceptual world of a creature would be that only live you know, 28 days, more or less. Um, and so he argued, you know, um, his, his assumption was that uh, the metabolic rate would be so much higher that, you know, over the course of the lifespan, this, this uh, fruit fly would have the same number of experiences as a human has in a lifespan of 80 years. Um, and so he, he pointed out that you know, the, the fruit fly does not live um, longer than a, a lunar cycle. So the idea that, you know, there is this thing in, 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 uh, in the sky that becomes bigger or smaller, but it's impossible to find any rhyme or reason for it. And, uh, and so, you know, a sunrise and a moonrise would be enormously slow events, and so everything would just happen much, much more slowly. And it sounds like the cloud is exactly that kind of thing. Uh, we have time for one more question. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I know it's easy in hindsight, in a, like a digital age, to look back at how this was done and think of a better way of doing it, but was there any, are you aware of any specific choices as to why it was so audio focused because it seems like a really convoluted way to get images into space where yeah. it would have been a better way of doing it. And it just kind of comes across as being almost like a, a project that an audio file would do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's a good question. So let's see. There, there was an earlier project in the Pioneer mission um, where they included famously a naked man and a naked woman, you know, the outlines of and the man raises his hand and the woman uh, uh, is you know posed slightly differently. That caused a huge amount of controversy in America at the time because nudity was being shown, and you know that's uh, that's just not okay in under no circumstances. And so they moved away from images uh, in uh, in in the Voyager mission. And I think you know the idea of including a uh, the golden record was a last minute idea. They only had six weeks to put this together. They did it in record time. Um, you know, basically, Carl Sagan was based at Cornell at the time, and so he just called up all his friends in the, you know, in ethnomusicology. They went to Washington to the Smithsonian and, uh, you know, and their, and their collection of uh, traditional music. They, uh, they contacted all their friends in, in New York, and so basically, whatever archives there were, um, they tried to get a hold of whatever they could, uh, they, they could find. Um, and uh, you know, the main, the main purpose of the mission was to take high quality images of the outer planets you know and uh, the, and you know f f if if you are an astrophysicist that is why the voyager mission was important but in the public imagination the the golden record really stuck and so if you go back to the 40th anniversary celebrations um, over the last uh, over the last year it's all about the golden record, and there is this human element that you know music is something that we all can instinctively relate to. That you know the tropes of music as a universal language really come into play, even though you know scientifically that's highly dubious. But I think it's uh, you know in terms of NASA relating to people who aren't astrophysicists themselves or who aren't uh, uh, you know who don't work uh, in that branch, the golden record was amazingly effective in. In relating, you know, the the mission um, as a public event. So, you know, I I think a lot of it was just lucky. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, 
I, I mean, you know, the, the other part of the story is that, you know, Carl Sagan was married to another woman at the time. He started working with, uh, with and, and Brian and they, they fell in love and got, you know, he got a divorce, they got married. So there's this whole angle that's been, you know, the, there's a documentary about that part. And so this is, this is part of the law as well. Um, and, uh, and, you know, all, all of this happened over the golden record. So, you know, it's, it's something that really speaks to the popular imagination. But you know the scientific value is rather more dubious. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much again, Alex, for making a not quite interstellar journey, <laughs> transatlantic journey. We're very grateful. Uh, I think that spoke to the interests of so many people in the room from so many different points of view. So that's that's what we aim to do. And um, I thank you very much, and hope to see you again at the next Web Science Distinguished Lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you.